invite you to open up your Bibles to two passages, Matthew 28, 1 through 10, which we read earlier, and also 1 Corinthians. Uh, we'll be in 1 Corinthians here in a little bit, but um, Matthew 28, 1 through 10 is a very familiar passage. We read it earlier, and so for time's sake, we will not read it again, but I just want you to make sure that you have it in front of you. Today, we just simply want to talk about three proofs and three promises of the resurrection. Three proofs and three promises of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And specifically, I want to ask and answer this question, how does the resurrection affect me personally? And I want you to ask that same question, how does the resurrection affect me? There are three proofs and three promises. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, we see clearly that Christ has risen from the dead. The real question is, what does that mean for you? What does that look like on a daily basis in pragmatic terms? Three proofs and three promises of the resurrection. Let's get right into it this morning. Number one, the resurrection proves the power of God to be sovereign. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves the power of God to be sovereign over all things and even over your life. The resurrection of Christ proves that God has all power and that that power is sovereign over all things. Ephesians 1, 19 through 20 is in your notes. It's not on the screen, and so I'll have you address that passage in your notes. Paul says in Ephesians, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of what? Of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty, here's our word again, Power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ attests to the supreme and limitless power of God. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. I don't understand anybody that would want to believe in God who could not rise anyone from the dead. Amen? If God exists and if he created the universe and has power over it, then he has power to raise the dead. If he does not have such power, he is not worthy of our faith and worship. In resurrecting Christ from the grave, God reminds us of his absolute sovereign power over life and over death. This ought to give us great peace in a world that has become obsessed with the fear of death. That is the time that we live in, is it not? Great fear in the midst of a virus. But for the believer, it brings peace to our hearts and to our minds and even to our lives because we know someone who has conquered death. We serve a God who has conquered death. There is something greater to fear in this life than dying. Are you listening this morning? There's something greater to fear in this life than simply dying and death. It is to die without knowing the one who has power over death. That should be your greatest fear. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves the absolute sovereignty, the absolute power to and over death. The resurrection of Christ proves the power of God to be sovereign. Do you believe that this morning? That God, our God, is all-powerful and has conquered death. But understand this as well. The resurrection proves the payment of God to be sufficient. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fact that he actually conquered death and rose from the grave, is proof from God himself that Jesus Christ paid the price that we could not pay. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is what, church? Death. Death. The wages of sin is death. Now, what does the term wages mean? Wages means penalty. It means a payment. And so the penalty or the payment for your sin, and listen, my sin, because all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the payment that is due for us is death. Not only physical death, but spiritual death, which is separation from a holy God. You see, sin must be paid for. God cannot overlook it 
or sweep it under the rug. That's what our society says today that they think that God does. That God simply just ignores sin. That he is so loving and they magnify his love so much that they tell us that God will forgive everyone. That every single person will be forgiven. But if that is the case, that means that God is not just. If that is the case, then God is not holy. But our God is just. Our God is holy and therefore we must pay for our sin. 1 Peter 3.18, the very first part of this verse, it says, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all time. Did you hear that? One time Christ suffered on the cross and before the cross in his beating and scourging. And he did it once for all time. Unlike the sacrificial sacrifice with the lambs. And they would have to sacrifice every year. Every year it was a repetitive process. But Christ suffered for sins once for all time. And then listen to this. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. It says the just, that is Christ, for the unjust, that is you and me. This is a simple doctrine, a basic doctrine of the Christian faith that churches have gone away from. Christ died in the place of all those who will trust in him and take their place in penalty. And he paid the penalty that they cannot pay and we cannot pay. This was the entire reason for the sacrificial system. You ever wonder why Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God? That's why John said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ is the Lamb, once slain forever, who takes away the sin of the world. But listen, we're talking about the crucifixion, aren't we? Right now, I'm talking about the crucifixion. But today is about what? It's about the resurrection, amen? The resurrection of Christ is different from the crucifixion of Christ in that it doesn't provide salvation. Are you listening? It proves that that salvation is sufficient. The resurrection of Christ is different in that it doesn't provide salvation. It proves the payment of God for your sin is enough. It's sufficient. You don't have to do anything except trust in the payment that was given. The resurrection of Christ proves Christ's sacrifice as sufficient. The resurrection of Jesus is, listen, our assurance. Would you say that word this morning? Assurance. You can have assurance this morning of salvation and of forgiveness before a holy and righteous and just God. The resurrection of Christ is our receipt. A while back I went and I purchased some golf equipment and specifically I splurged. And I got a brand new driver from Academy Sports. And I spent $264.99 on one club. And you say, I'm not listening to you anymore. You're insane. Amen? As I walked out of there, feeling like a crazy person, and knowing that it wasn't going to really help me at all in terms of my golf game, I knew at least that if somebody stopped me at the door with that driver in my hand, that I could pull out this and say, it is paid in full. It might not help my golf game at all, but I've paid for this club, and I'm going to golf with it, and you can never take it back because I have paid it in full, and this is my proof. Amen? Amen. That is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is for those who have trusted in him as the payment for their sins. He is the receipt. The resurrection is the receipt that says paid in full. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If Christ were still in the tomb, it would mean we still have sin. You still have a debt. If Jesus is still dead, if he never rose from the grave, you still owe God. Are you listening? It is a debt that you cannot pay, and that why, that's why hell is eternal. Because it is, it is an eternal debt. 
If Christ were still in the tomb, it would mean we still have a sin debt and we cannot pay. And we even now, we would stand guilty before God. But Paul also wrote in Romans 4.25 that he, who is Jesus, was delivered up for our trespasses. And listen to this. Are you listening? Say amen. And raised for our justification. The The resurrection of Christ proves and is proof of and is a receipt of The fact that you, if you have trusted in Christ and his work on the cross, not in your own works, it's not a scale, oh, i got to do more good deeds than bad deeds. No, that you've put your whole faith and trust in Christ for salvation. That you know that what he did provides forgiveness of sins. If you have done that, then the resurrection screams that you have been justified. It is not that the resurrection accomplished our justification... Jesus' sinless life and sin-bearing death did that. That's what the cross was. But rather, the resurrection assures us of our justification. See, it was God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. And by that act, God declared that Christ's sacrificial payment had been accepted. The penalty for our sins was paid in full. The resurrection was God's declaration that he had canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. The resurrection, once and for all, proves forever that our sin debt has been paid in full. That should have got a louder amen. (laughs) The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves the power of God to be sovereign. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves the payment of God to be sufficient. Now, this is getting, this morning, you're getting straight doctrine. That's what you're getting. You're getting theology. You see, every person is a theologian, whether you want to be or not. Because you have views, you have an understanding of God, you have a belief about God, and you know what that's called? That's called theology, your personal theology. But listen, your personal theology doesn't matter. What matters is what God says about himself, amen? Amen. And so you need to come to an understanding, a head understanding, and a heart understanding of the simple truths of the doctrines of the basic faith of Christianity, which is that God is capable of raising the dead. That's number one. Jesus Christ rose from the grave and it proves that God is all-powerful. But also understand that his payment, that what he did was enough. You don't have to add a single thing to it. Praise God. That's why we always preach in this church grace. Grace. You live by grace. What is grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And so you live the Christian life, you live, listen, a victorious Christian life over sin, over the things you don't want to do, by first doing this, God, thank you. Gratitude is what brings victory over sin. As you recognize the payment has been paid in full, you realize you don't owe anything. You realize you don't have to do anything. You don't do things out of guilt. You don't do things because you have to. You don't do things because you think you're going to get punished by God. God's not up there with a big stick waiting to whack you over the back of the head so you shape up, right? No, Christians who understand what God did for them in Jesus Christ live for God and live for Christ because the payment has been made, a payment that we could not pay. We couldn't do it, and so God has done it, and the resurrection of Christ proves that the payment of God is sufficient on our behalf. Thirdly, the resurrection proves the person of God to be supernatural. When I talk about the person of God, I'm not talking about you and me. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The resurrection proves that Jesus was indeed the divine Son of God. In Romans 1, 1 through 4, this is what Paul says. He introduces himself and says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and singled out for God's good news, which he promised long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh. What is that statement? That statement is another doctrine. You guys are learning doctrine this morning. Are you excited about it? Say amen. Amen. Doctrine dictates how you live, and so you need to know it. You can't go off your feelings because feelings change. That one phrase, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, speaks to the humanity of Christ. He was 100% human being. 
But the next line says in verse 4, And who has been declared to be the powerful Son of God, how? By the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness. He is 100% God, 100% man. This is the hypostatic union of Christ, something that your mind cannot fathom. And listen, 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 that's a good thing. Because if you can serve a God that only you can fathom and comprehend and understand, you're not serving a big God, you're serving yourself. There should be things in Scripture, things that you come to about God that you just wonder and say, well, I guess I won't know until the other side of heaven. The resurrection from the dead. That's how he is proved to be the Son of God. And there is no greater way to prove a point than to rise from the dead. Amen? Somebody rises from the dead, you listen to them. You believe them. Jerry Bridges has a profound quote regarding the resurrection of Christ. He says, In actuality, it was impossible for Jesus' body to remain in the grave, just as it was impossible for the divine nature of Jesus to die because God cannot die. So it was impossible for the human nature of Jesus to remain dead because of its union with his divine nature. Are you following? Say amen. Amen. Peter said on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 24 that God raised him up, speaking of Christ, losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Why? Because Christ is God. And death has no power over him. It was not possible for Jesus' body to remain in the grave. And in raising him from the grave, God declared beyond a shadow of all doubt that this Jesus, whom lawless men crucified, was indeed the divine Son of God. That's why John 1.4 says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Listen, it's not just that Jesus gives life. He does. Jesus is life. Jesus is the reason that you were born, that you were conceived. He is the giver of all life. He does more than give life. He is life, and that's why death has no power over him. No power, none. Jehovah Witness came to my door a while back. We began to conversate a little bit right there on the threshold of the door. We got into some deep discussions about Christ, because that's where the conversation should always lead for the believer. Who is Jesus? This will weed out cults and false teachings. One of the questions he posed to me, which he thought he got me, he said, you think Jesus is God? I said, absolutely. I don't think that. The Bible says that. He said, how can God die? Hmm. Good job. Wrong. (laughs) He can't. He said, then Jesus can't be God. To which I simply replied that you are mistaking the material flesh with the immaterial God. The body of Christ died. God himself in Jesus Christ did not. It's a simple bit of information. But makes all the difference between false belief and true belief. God did not die, rather he laid down his physical life so that I might have eternal life through him who is life. John 10, 18 says, Jesus is speaking, he says, no one takes my life from me, I give it up willingly. And then he says this, I have the power, the power to do what? To take life up again once it's dead. Only God can do that. I have the power to give it up and the power to receive it back again, just as my father commanded me to do. How many of you remember the story of Lazarus? Even if you didn't grow up in Sunday school or church, you've probably heard about Lazarus. In John eleven thirty nine, 39, it recounts the story of Lazarus. Just to, for some context, Jesus delays purposefully two days going to Lazarus, who he has heard from Lazarus' family, Mary and Martha, that he is sick. And when they say sick, they mean he's about to die. And Jesus and his disciples understand this. They know this. And Jesus says, I'm going to wait. And then he goes after Lazarus dies. And Lazarus has been dead for how many days, church? 
Four days this guy's been in the tomb. John eleven thirty nine. 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Before all this, Martha is telling the Lord, If you'd just been here, if you'd just been here, my brother would never have even died. And Jesus replies with the famous passage, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet will he live. And Martha says, Lord, I know in the last day, at the final day, at the resurrection day, all will rise. That's when he'll rise. And Jesus says, no, 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 I'm the resurrection and the life. I am life. I can give life to anybody I want, including that man that's been dead for four days. Jesus said, take you away the stone. Can you imagine that moment? Imagine your relative dead for four days in a tomb. Jesus comes up and says, go ahead, remove the stone. It was a a cave-like tomb with a stone, a big stone in front of it. Take away the stone. Do you remember what Martha said? That dude stinks. That's not verbatim. (laughs) He stinketh. I like the King James Version. He stinketh. He hath been dead for four days. See, decomposition of the human body begins within 24 hours after death. And within as little as 6 to 72 hours, the corpse begins to stink. I've been around a lot of dead bodies in my life. That came out weird. (laughs) I'm a pastor, so I'm around a lot of funerals. I've seen a lot of dead bodies, and we have progressed to the point where there is no smell, at least for a while. You say, this is odd, this is weird that we're talking about this. It's important. Because I realized this week, it dawned on me this week, that when Jesus died, he never stank. <laughs> he just didn't. His body did not stink, because his body never decayed. You say, what in the world does that have to do with anything? It's just another little proof that Christ himself was God. And of the powerful promise of God to keep his word. Because in Psalm 1610, it says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo what, church? Decay. Acts 13, 36 through 37, for David, after he had served God's purposes in his own generation, fell asleep, that means he died, and was buried among his fathers, and underwent what church? Decay. But he, that is Christ, whom God raised, did not undergo decay. I researched this a lot this week because I didn't want to be wrong about this. That would be kind of embarrassing, right? But because of the word of God and because of what Christ has told us in the New Testament and the prophecy of the Old Testament, we can be assured that our Savior, even his flesh, didn't decay. It didn't rot. The physical body of our Lord died, but it did not decay, proving unequivocally that Jesus Christ, listen, listen, is the Holy One. That's what the Old Testament says. The Holy One will not see decay. The physical body of our Lord died, but it did not decompose, proving unequivocally himself to be the Holy One, deity, God in the flesh, and the resurrection proves this. Now this has all been doctrine intended to set you up to understand promises, how it relates to you personally in your life. You see, if you do not believe that God has the power to resurrect Jesus Christ, if you fail to believe that Christ's sacrificial payment is sufficient and enough, or if you refuse to believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God, you will never, ever, ever be able to believe in these promises. And so belief is the basis for living a victorious life and understanding what God would have you to do. So as we continue, we go from proofs to promises. Here are the promises. Number four in your notes, the resurrection of Christ promises a future resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ promises a future resurrection. That's what Martha was talking about. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles 
to the book of 1 Corinthians, if you haven't already found your place there. I'll give you a moment to go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, I love the sound of the word of God, the pages turning. Keep turning, keep turning, I'll wait. This is a very, very important passage for you and for me. Because the resurrection of Christ promises a future resurrection for those who will trust in him. First, Chris, First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 20, 23, if you're there, say, he is risen. We can do a little bit better than that, amen? If you're there, say, he is risen. Much better, church. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 through 23. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead. The, listen, first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the, here's our words again, first fruits after that those who are Christ at his coming. Those words are important. First fruits, what does that mean? That means the first fruit that you go out when I was young and I went to that orange tree in my backyard and I got the first orange that appeared on that tree. No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a harvest. The first harvest. The first fruits of the season. And Christ, the Bible says, Jesus is the first fruits. It means he's first That means that there are more to come. Amen? Guess who the more to come is? It's you and me who have trusted in Jesus Christ. Wayne Grudem, theologian, talks about this. This is what we refer to in theological terms as glorification. In our church, are you listening to say amen? If you don't know anything about Cornerstone Baptist, know that we teach doctrine, we teach theology because we know it helps you know God. And the more you know about God, the more you can live a godly life. As you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it changes who you are and it changes your outflow as your inflow is from the Lord and from understanding who he is. As he becomes more beautiful, your life becomes more beautiful. And so Wayne Grudem talking about glorification, we have salvation What is salvation? It's simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. The Bible says that salvation is not of works of righteousness, lest any man should boast. It's nothing you could ever do to earn the favor or forgiveness of God. And Christ did it all. That's a sufficient payment. That's salvation. But then we have what? We have what, church? Sanctification. Some of y'all are going through sanctification this week, this month, this last year. Amen? You know what I'm talking about because sanctification usually involves the hard things in your life that God allows to come into your life to refine you, to make you more like Jesus. God does not just want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. And that's what sanctification is all about. So when something bad happens in your life, you can understand that God is working on you if you are a true believer and follower of Jesus Christ. You are being sanctified. Salvation, sanctification. But here's the one, listen church, here's the one we often leave out. Glorification. And I think we need to talk a lot more about glorification in the church. Because it is the hope in the midst of a pandemic. People are losing their minds. Scared to go to church. Scared to go to the grocery store. Scared to go outside. Scared to hug someone they love. And listen, maybe for well reason, but here's the point I'm making this morning. When you know Christ, when you've been saved, when you're being sanctified, and when you have hope of the glorification, that is the renewing of your body, all fear dissipates. And the more often you remind yourself that one day, One day, yes, I will die, but one day I will rise, and therefore I need not fear. What kind of life is it to live in fear? It's not a life. And Christ gives you freedom to live and obey him in every area of your life and to live without fear because of the glorification that will come. Glorification is the final step in the application of redemption. It will happen when Christ returns and raises from the dead the bodies of all believers for all time who have died and changes the bodies of all believers who remain alive, thereby giving all believers at the same time perfect resurrection bodies like his own. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're with me this morning, say amen. Look at verse 51 through 57. Behold, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthian believers. 
I am telling you a mystery. We will not all sleep. He's saying we will not all stay asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised and perishable. And we will be changed, for the perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal, and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you've ever suffered in this life, this verse means more to you. If you've ever suffered physically or emotionally or any type of suffering at all, you understand what it means to look forward to this day, to look forward to the glorification. Listen, we need more Christians that look and focus on the glorification to come. It will see you through those trials. It will see you through those health issues. It will see you through that suffering. Because you can hold on to that promise that one day you and I will rise as well. The promise of a future resurrection is the promise of death defeated. Listen to me this morning. Death does not have power over us because it did not have power over Christ. Jesus' resurrection is the precursor and the model of our own future resurrection. Our bodies will be like his resurrected body. And somebody in here today is no doubt saying, I don't believe in this. Okay, tune out. Let me speak to the believers for a moment. I want to tell you what you have to look forward to. As a follower and believer in Jesus Christ, you have some pretty amazing things to look forward to. Because what was the body of Jesus like after his resurrection? Well, Scripture tells us first, if you want to write these down, these are not in your notes, but it's some good encouragement this morning. Number one, he was able to suddenly appear and disappear. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> he was able to suddenly appear and and disappear. John 20, 26, eight days later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut. That means they are locked solid. Why? They just crucified their leader. They're coming after them. The disciples are scared. They were human, so they locked themselves in a room, probably triple bolted. All the doors are locked, no win windows open, and what does the scripture say? Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Boo! <laughs> that would have been cool, right? <laughs> but I'm not, I, that's what I would have done. Obviously, I'm not Jesus. He says what Jesus would say, peace be to you. See, I love to scare my wife. Amen? Y'all are like, you need to stop right now. <laughs> I like to scare my wife. It's fun. Isn't it, Nikki? No. No amen there. Not at all. I like to scare my wife. I jump out. She's, I've paid for that dearly a couple times. Got a stick of deodorant to the eye once. Um, that was exciting. But in heaven, I wonder if she's going to get me back. <laughs> Disappear, reappear. There's Nikki. Ah, look out. Getting off track, sorry. It sounds unbelievable, but it's, it's what's going to be for you and for me. I don't know what this looks like in real life, in, in, in reality, in, in eternity, in heaven. But I know that we'll have this ability as well because our, our Christ had this ability because our bodies are going to be like his bodies. In John 24, 30 through 31, it says, And it came about, this is again after the resurrection, when he had, when he had reclined at the table with them. He had been traveling with some people. He, disciples, he, he goes to their home, he begins to eat with them. It says that he took the bread and blessed it and he broke it and began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened. He veiled their eyes so that they couldn't realize who he was after the resurrection. It says their eyes were opened. And what happened? And they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. I don't know if this is like teleportation. <laughs> I don't understand it. I just think it's really cool. And I'm serious. I'm looking forward to stuff like this. And you should too. There's nothing wrong with that. This is pretty amazing stuff. There's a reason we like superhero, superhero movies. Right? We're like, man, I wish I had that power. Guess what? You do. And the glorification to come. Secondly, he was able to prepare food and eat it. 
In John 21, 9, 12, and 13, it says, So when they got out of the, on the land, these are the disciples, they're fishing all night, and they, they get on the land, they saw a charcoal fire, listen, already made, and fish place on it. See, Jesus had already been cooking. How many of you like to cook? How many of you like to bake, cook, do all those things? One more time, give me your hands. There's a lot. I like to eat. Amen? I like that my wife likes to cook, and I like to eat. It works out well. It's like God knew and paired us together. But here's the deal. Jesus is preparing food on the shore. He's cooking food. You say, this is a simple thing. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of his disciples ventured to inquire of him, who are you? That's a weird statement. Did you hear that? It says, none of them, none of them thought to ask, who are you? Why would it say that like that? It's because Jesus' body was different, but it was the same. There was a sense in which they recognized him, but there was a sense in which he was different. But not only that, Christ is doing some physical things here. He's cooking. He's frying fish over, over an open fire. Listen, some people think that heaven's just going to be all flutes and harps and angels floating, and you're just going to be a spirit not doing anything wrong. Your physical body will allow you to do the things that God has designed you to do. You like to work with your hands? I imagine that you'll be able to do that in heaven. Because Christ's physical body was able to do that. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. That shows us he ate. We see also in John chapter 20 that they gave him fish and bread and he ate. So we will have some type of physical aspect to this resurrected body. But also we notice that he could be touched and had a real physical body. In John 20, 26 through 27... This is the same passage we've mentioned before. This is Doubting Thomas. I remember, remember Doubting Thomas. I mean, that stinks that he got that name, doesn't it? This guy was a, just a, a, a really good guy, a really godly guy once he saw Christ, but he doubted. Many of us doubt. God had grace with him. Said Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Place your finger here. What is he talking about? Right here. Go ahead and put your... Put your finger in my side where they pierce me with a spear, Thomas. That would gross me out. <laughs> it shows us that Christ had a physical body. He also, lastly in Acts chapter 1-9, ascended into the sky. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were watching, and a cloud took him up out of their sight. Now listen, we didn't do a very deep study this morning of what the physical body of Christ was like and therefore what the physical body of, of believers will be. But we can ascertain from simple verses that it will be supernatural, but it will be functional. Listen, listen, listen. It will be recognizable to you all that are wanting to see that person that passed. Of course we're going to be able to recognize each other. We won't have the same relationship because the relationship of Christ will be so real and so great and so, so fulfilling that we won't care as much about, listen, this is going to sound weird, but about the people that we love right here, right now. The love that will be experienced between us and the Lord will be so great and so overwhelming. And yet, in his grace, I believe he will allow us to recognize one another and have joy and fellowship with one another as we worship him for all of eternity. They will be superhuman bodies, physical bodies, supernatural bodies, functional bodies, and recognizable bodies. Because Christ rose, this means I too will rise. The famous Sir Walter Raleigh was beheaded, and after his execution, his Bible was found, and in it some notes that he had written the night before his execution. Among the notes were these striking lines. He said, our joys are all we have, speaking of this life. And here's how it pays out, he says, and pays us but with age and dust to win the dark and silent grave. That's pessimistic, isn't it? <laughs> That's a grumpy face right there. He says, our joys, the good times in life, the pleasures are all we have. But what it pays out is we get older and we turn to dust and it gets dark and there's a grave. He continues, though, when we have wandered all our ways. Shuts up the story of our days, but from this earth, this grave, this dust, my God shall raise me up, I trust. Man, that's hope-filled. This is a person on his deathbed knowing he's going to the gallows. 
he reminds himself that he too will rise. There is a resurrection to come, church. And because of Christ, because Christ rose, I too will rise. Fifthly, the resurrection of Christ promises, listen, freedom from sin. So there's a resurrection to come. There's glorification to come. We have hope in the future. But there is a promise right now that the resurrection gives us of freedom from all of our sin. True freedom is not the ability to do whatever I want. Are you listening? Say amen. Amen. True freedom is the ability to do what is good, right, and best for you. See, I don't know if I believe that. I think freedom is being able to do what I want. I can look at what I want. I can drink what I want. I can do the drugs I want. I can have sex when I want. I can live how I want. I can do anything I want. That's freedom. Ask any alcoholic. Ask any drug addict. Ask any, any person that's addicted to anything. Ask them if they're free. They're not. True freedom comes from Christ, and the resurrection guarantees that freedom. Right now, because of the resurrection, believers don't have to wait for victory. The resurrection of Christ means I can live in freedom right now. Would you say right now this morning? Right now. Even saying that this last week, sometimes I'm like, does it really? I'm going to be transparent with you. I still have sin in my life because I'm a fallen human being. I'm a sinful person. And so are you. And if you're not struggling with sin, it means you're not trying. <laughs> because we all have sin in our life. But the question is, is what is your desire? Is it to be free from that sin? Christ promises freedom from sin right now. Some of you want to be free but believe you will never be free this side of heaven. And the resurrection says otherwise. (laughs) Romans 6, 1 through 4, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, God forbid it. Don't let it happen, Lord. Should we just keep doing the things because we have forgiveness in Jesus Christ and a resurrection to come? Should we just continue in sin? Paul says at the top of his lungs, God, don't allow it. Don't let it happen. Don't let it ever be that I would take the sacrifice and the payment of Jesus Christ and his suffering and his cross so for granted that I would just sin on his behalf. How awful a thought. We are those who have died to sin, he says. How can we live any longer in it? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his, listen, listen, death. We were therefore buried with him through the baptism into death. Death. You should have died some point in your life. Spiritually, you should have died to yourself. Died to your sin. And rose in Christ, with Christ. Not, we're not talking about physical baptism. We're talking about being in Christ. When you trusted in Jesus Christ, you should have died. Buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Listen, we too may, you know what the verse says? It doesn't say be resurrected in the future. It says live a new life. And the implication is now. The resurrection gives you the power to live a new life now. Romans 8, 11, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also, listen, give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's not talking about physical life. It's talking about spiritual life. Because Christ was victorious over death, you and I can be victorious in this life. Do you believe that this morning, Christian? Now, I'm sure if you're human like me, you might have doubts from time to time because you think about that habitual sin that you cannot get over. Listen, just because you can't get over a sin doesn't negate or void the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. God is filled with patience and grace towards us. And I want to say to you, don't beat yourself up. Keep pressing. Keep living. Keep trying. Keep walking in the Spirit. God will free you. God will free you. God will free you because of the resurrection. Lastly, the resurrection of Christ promises a final judgment. The resurrection of Jesus Christ promises a final judgment. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. I want you to pay very close attention. Look on the screen with me. For he has set a day, this is God the Father, he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. How? By the man he has appointed. Who is that man, church? It is Jesus Christ. 
He has given proof of this to everyone. How, church? By raising him from the dead. The proof that God has appointed Jesus Christ to judge every single person is evidenced in the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Jesus authenticates the authority of Christ. Do you remember after the resurrection and he tells the disciples, go and make disciples. Do you remember that one little part that says, I have been given all what? Authority. The resurrection, in the resurrection, God the Father hands over all authority to Jesus Christ the Son. Listen, that includes judgment, final judgment. Why? Because Jesus one day will judge not just according to what we have done, but what we have done with him. What we have done with Christ. And therefore he has the authority to judge all according to the truth that he displayed on the cross and as he rose from the dead. The resurrection of Christ according to God the Father has vindicated Christ as, listen, worthy, 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 no sin, God in the flesh, crucified for sinners, took the payment, took the penalty, and it is proof, proof, proof that he is worthy, holy, Lord of all, Lord of lords, King of kings, and he will one day judge rightly the living and the dead. Jesus is not only God's chosen means of redemption, he is God's chosen means of judgment. You say, this sermon took a weird turn. It was hope, hope, hope. Now you're talking about judgment because the hope doesn't matter if you don't understand the judgment to come. God did not spare his own son because it was the only way he could spare us and sp still be a just and holy God. And listen to me. Those who reject such a good and glorious gift from God will be rightly judged on the day of judgment. The resurrection proves that Jesus has all authority, and that authority includes final judgment of all who reject his loving sacrifice. You don't go to hell simply only because of your sin. If you go to hell, it's because you've rejected the gift of Jesus Christ. Every single person hearing my voice today will one day stand before Christ. You say, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter if you believe it. It only matters what is true. And what is true is Christ has risen from the grave and he offers you forgiveness. And if you will trust in him, he will save you. But for those who reject his sacrifice, the resurrection of Christ stands as a testament, as proof to the authority of Christ to judge you for rejecting him on the day of judgment. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 says this, Then I saw a great white throne. This is the final judgment. And on him was seated, and, hit, and I saw him who was seated on it. Who is it speaking of? This is not God the Father. This is Jesus Christ seated on the throne. It says, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence. Now I want you to notice something. We're almost done, I promise. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. What is that talking about? This world is going to be destroyed. The heavens will be destroyed. God is going to make a new heavens and a new earth. Now the implicit, the, 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 the reality of this is that there is nowhere for anyone who rejects Christ to run on the day of judgment. They can't go back to their possessions. They can't go back to their sin. They can't go back to this world. They can't even go out into space. There's nowhere for them to run. They are forced to stand at the great white throne of judgment. And I saw the dead, great and small. That is not stature. That is not physical stature. That is, I don't care if you're poor Rich, white, black, doesn't matter. I don't care if you've been abused. I don't care if you've had a be the best life ever. I don't care what you've experienced in this life. You will stand before Christ. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And our living God is Jesus Christ. People don't believe in the resurrection of Christ because they don't want to be held accountable. It's not a matter of intellect. 
You don't want to be held accountable for your sin. But one day, the resurrected Christ himself will hold all accountable. But the good news of Easter is that Jesus bore the judgment of God so that you and I would not have to. And to those who will trust in him, he promises freedom now and life eternal in the resurrection to come. Amen? Amen. Here's the application this morning. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. Do not deceive yourself. Those who have truly believed in Christ have been raised to walk, listen, in newness of life. If there is no newness of life, there has been no true belief. There are two kinds of belief in this world. There is two kinds of belief in the church. Belief with the mind and belief with the life. My question for you this morning is what does your life say you believe? What does my life say I believe? It's not a matter of head knowledge. It's not a prayer you said a long time ago. It's not believing facts. The demons believe and tremble. But does your life prove that you believe that Christ died for you, that he rose for you, and that he's coming again? Let's pray.